Hi, everyone. Welcome to our joint PGA VES panel that will look into the basics of virtual production. My name is Jenny Ogden, and I'm the VP of New Media for the Producers Guild. And I'm Ben Schneider from the Visual Effects Society. We'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We have PGA Board of Directors, New Media Council Delegate, Christina Lee Storm, who's Manager of Visual Production at Netflix, Netflix and is going to moderate the panel discussion. Thank you for joining us, Christina. Thank you so much, Ben and Jenny. Um, I just also wanted to thank the PGA and VS for hosting this two-part panel on virtual production. A big thank you to our amazing production uh, planning team Ben, Jenny, Greg, Tanya, Keegan, Lara, and the amazing Emma Orner. Um, tonight, I'm, I'm especially excited about the panel as I've wanted to share with fellow producers how virtual production is creating new opportunities for filmmakers and what that means for key creatives collaborating throughout the process from inception to production to post. Basically, virtual production encompasses a large group of techniques that have been around for some time. For example, rear projection and previs. And today, virtual production encompasses a number of techniques and is increasingly more prevalent in production. Tomorrow, we see the democratization of these technologies and workflows continue to evolve, not only in the way content is being produced, but also how stories are told. So for tonight's panel, our speakers will go more in depth in certain aspects of virtual production. For now, let me highlight the most widely used virtual production techniques and the techniques that all of you should be aware of. These include, um, uh, let's start with world capture, which includes LIDAR scanning and photogrammetry, digitizing and capturing spatial, spatially accurate real world locations, sets, props, and actors to share and use anywhere. We'll also cover tonight visualization, which includes previs, allowing us to see early iterations of final shots and CG assets. The aim is to discover early on story beats, camera moves, and set designs. Visualization also includes virtual location scouting, virtual camera, pitch viz, tech viz, stunts, and post viz. Also tonight, we will cover uh, Simulcam, which blends live action and onset computer graphics in real time for reference and camera tracking. It's basically like an AR game where you are extending reality to blend the digital world and the physical world. We also will highlight performance capture, which, which includes motion capture. This is the process of recording the movement of objects or people. When it includes face or fingers or captures uh, subtle expressions, it's often referred to as performance or facial capture. And lastly, in-camera VFX is a methodology for shooting real-time visual effects during a live action sh film shoot that includes interactive lighting. Its primary goal is to remove the need for green screen compositing to produce final pixel results in camera. So we're gonna cover a bunch. There's a lot to do, but let me kick us off. We have an extreme, extremely talented group of panelists that are working in virtual production joining us tonight. Let's meet our panelists. Let's start off, uh, we have Greg Baxter, executive producer. Thank you for joining us. Please tell us about yourself. Unmute, unmute and tell us about yourself. Uh, I think I'm unmuted. Um, I'm Greg Baxter. Uh, I've been working in digital production for over 20 years. Uh, and in that time, I've seen digital production go from more of a post-production element to very much in the forefront of production planning. And I think tonight we're going to talk about some of the latest reasons why that is so. We also have Sophia Yu, uh, visualization supervisor at the third floor. Please introduce yourself. Hey guys, I'm a supervisor at the third floor. I've been doing visualization for about five years now, and there I've learned previs, post viz, tech viz, the whole shebang. Uh, really awesome, really excited to be here today. Thanks, guys. Welcome. Um, Mariana Acuna, CPO of Glassbox Technologies. Hi, everyone. Yeah, CPO stands for Chief Product Officer of Glass Co founder. And at Glassbox, we do uh, tools for virtual production that are easy to use. And uh, with, I co founded it with Norman uh, around five years ago. And I am also a virtual production mentor for the Unreal Engine Epic Games Fellowship. 
Welcome. Uh, also, our panelist, Yannicka Mickelson, uh, virtual cinematographer. Please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I am Yannicka, Yannicka Mickelson. Uh, I am a virtual cinematographer, uh, also a director of cinematography. Um, there shouldn't really be much difference between virtual and real life. And I think we're going to get into it today to explain how similar these two worlds are and, and try and get uh, the elder generation on board with what uh, amazing worlds we can open up with virtual productions. Great. Okay, so before we sort of kick off our first little dive into virtual production, I do want to um, let everyone know, all of our uh, attendees, we're very excited to cover all things virtual production and we want to encourage questions throughout. So feel free to type them into our Q&A at the bottom of your screen. There's a little Q&A button and we will try to cover as many as we can. Um, and, and also at the end, we have some resources to recommend. So add your Q&As at the bottom and then uh, at the tail end, we'll be doing a little Q&A session. Okay. Um, before we sort of really dig into some of the techniques and whatnot, I do want to kick it off with this concept that people hear virtual production and immediately they see dollar signs. You know, they're like, oh, that's so expensive. Um, a lot of people do feel it is expensive. So I want to start off, Greg, with, you, with this question to you. What are your thoughts about this? about virtual production being expensive. Uh, you know, filmmaking is, is expensive and a lot of different elements have costs to them. Uh, virtual production, it's like you said, is a set of techniques. Uh, I think the most uh, commonly associated one is the LED wall and LED volume. Uh, and, and we know that that's got a certain price point to it. But I think what we'll find as we're talking about these different techniques is the, the biggest value to the virtual production elements is being able to collaborate uh, earlier on with, uh, with all of your different department heads and plan um, uh, so that the shoot, the, the, the progress of production is much more efficient because the plans have been made and we've avoided hurdles down the stretch. Um, so when you look at every aspect of virtual production on your show and what that specific cost is, you, you know, it's, you're not just looking at the offset on, am I getting um, value out of my in-camera visual effects and is that paying for itself? It's really all the other elements that go into it, the, the ability to avoid costly hurdles or pivoting on expensive shoot days um, or building sets that aren't going to be used. You know, you can see that before you put hammer to nail. Um, so I think that's, I think my response would be, it's not necessarily expensive. It's really, are you, are you using it the right way to give yourself that efficiency and save yourself uh, costs down the stretch? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not sure. Sophia, did you want to add to any of that? Like just in, in terms of uh, folks that you work with and the idea, the concept of like virtual production is so expensive. Yeah, and I can definitely get more into this later, but I think that a lot of people, uh, just like Greg said, are thinking of that LED screen, uh, you know, they're thinking, oh, we need like tons of manpower to like build this technology. We need engineers. We need technical people like handling all the computer stuff it's like it's so much work and you know I think people need to realize that for virtual production there's such a wide range of techniques you can use that goes down from you know building these like massive uh, structures that you need like an entire sound stage to prepare or you know just looking at an iPad and you know being able to see like your characters on screen or plan your CG set environments like on the computer so I think there's a lot of really simple forms of virtual production that can be incorporated into productions just to make them, you know, much more cost effective down the line because you're going to be doing a lot of that planning ahead of time instead of waiting until the end to realize, you know, that you may have missed like some details while you're planning for your shoots. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, all right, well, I'm going to I'm not sure. Yannicka, would you like to add or Mariana want to add to? Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, you actually got me thinking about um, there just seems to be a general fear of technology in the film industry. Uh, you know, we just recently or recently moved from analog to digital, now from digital to virtual productions, whether that's 360 VR, XR, AR. Uh, and we're just bombarding uh, our market with all these phrases and, and essentially it's all virtual productions. And there shouldn't be a fear of technology because essentially our job is to create tools that are as similar to the traditional tool sets that we use on the floor anyways. 
um, absolutely an advantage to move into virtual production. Yeah. Yeah, and just to add to that, again, I think people are just thinking about like the, you know, professional motion tracking systems and a big volume and LED walls, but absolutely not. And I always love to chime in for Has the Low, who's an amazing filmmaker. They can look at our battlefield and basically, you know, super low cost like suit to do the performance capture. And then he's using, you know, an iPad for the virtual camera and he used assets from the marketplace free in a real engine. So basically he did this short to start pitching his film, which he did get funding for. And he did it in such a cost effective way. So yes, of course you can go, you know, like the Mandalorian budget, but you can start creating and start visualizing right away at a very, very low cost. Yeah. So uh, just one, one more element I was thinking of the, the, notion that you know you look at a ledger for um, for pre-production for production for the, for the shoot and for post and a lot of the virtual production techniques especially the led volume bring some costs that are normally there in post-production in sort of a separate budget and maybe with separate eyeballs looking at it and we bring that forward and so at the beginning of a production you're now looking at you know big dollar amounts that are being spent not all of that is necessarily um, additional money for virtual production a lot of it's just moving costs from post to prep so that if you build those CG environments that we normally do and, and visual effects and post from a green screen, you build that first so you can put it on the LED wall. And so a lot of folks that really are only looking at the physical production budget are now seeing those and going, oh my God, we've added so much money, but, um, but not all of it is added. You know, the, the cost of building the wall is gonna be in theory offset within camera VFX costs, but some of the content being built for it is always gonna be there. It's just now being spent earlier to help us all do it together and collaborate together and avoid hurdles. Yeah, exactly. So Greg, um, you were the executive producer for Netflix's The Midnight Sky and other films that utilize virtual production. I, I'd love to ask you, why did you use virtual production instead of like classic green screen techniques? Um, I, so I think we're talking mostly about the LED volume um, it, for that. The When you look at the LED volume, when you look at the cost of you know, the LED panels are expensive. Uh, they're basically each a, a little um, processor or computer and you put a lot of those together, it's a big cost. Um, so the, the basic metric you start with is, what is this gonna save me in, in visual effects or post-production costs? And you can do a pretty quick mathematical calculation on that. If it's a 500 shots, you're guessing that you might get uh, on that wall uh, that may cost an average of 5,000 or so per shot. You've got a couple million dollars you're saving is that cost being offset with putting the wall up and the crew that it takes to run it. But where we were looking at, it wasn't just that. And that sort of offset itself. The other added bonus or multiple added bonuses of putting up an LED volume and shooting with virtual production, um, you've got something for the actor, for the cameraman, uh, for the director to perform against that isn't just a green screen. You don't have to use your imagination to see what's out there, it's there. And so you're gonna get a better performance and a more efficient performance out of those different elements. Um, the set is being largely lit by that LED volume. And so reflections are accurate. They're not green spill. It's you know, the glasses, the props, the, the walls are being reflected by what should be out, uh, out in that environment. Um, you're also getting um, a better efficiency on in, in between setups, you're moving a lot quicker. There's not a lot of relighting because most of the light is coming from that wall. So you're going to move some key lights, but not necessarily 30 minute resets for, for massive, you know, positioning of, of big lighting setups. Um, so there's a lot of efficiencies that happen there and better performance that come from uh, what's, what's out there on that wall. In addition that for us, we had an environment that just wasn't easy to shoot. Um, we were shooting in a, in a glacier during the snowstorm and very foreboding um, natural elements. And we did do some of that. You know, George definitely went out in the snow with, with the kid on the, on the scooter. But um, for these scenes where we spent a good portion of our movie in Florida ceiling windows looking out at this terrible environment, uh, it was much more efficient for us to do that on stage in a controlled area with that environment being piped through the windows. So the actor could still feel the loneliness and the solitude of what was out there. Um, the, the, the lighting, the camera could all see it. Um, but um, it, it just, it, it wasn't really something we could shoot. We couldn't just build that set out there in the snow and green screen was gonna put spill everywhere. So it was, it was kind of a no brainer on multiple levels, uh, but yeah. what we found the best efficiency wasn't just the visual effects offset. It was definitely 
all of the other bonuses you get from having an environment in camera. Yeah. We have a behind the scenes video from the Midnight Sky. Um, before we show it, do you want to briefly walk through some of the techniques to use on Midnight Sky? Absolutely. Yeah. So we just talked about the LED volume um, and that was, that was probably one of the biggest footprints we had for virtual production. Um, we had some other issues come up uh, in, during the pre-production process. Um, one of our actors, uh, after we cast, uh, turned out they were unable to physically perform some of the work we needed to have done for the um, zero gravity uh, outer space moments. And so we looked to performance capture, both in body and also in, in facial performance capture, where we could get, you know, we had, we had a, a very talented actor. We wanted to get her performance um, and not just... Uh, try to figure it out and, and animate in between, but really get every little nuance of what she could do in camera. So we had, um, we used Anima uh, with the Stone's latest uh, facial performance capture techniques. Uh, and we were able to put multiple cameras on her so she could, she could move about. She wasn't constrained to just a box. She could perform any way she wanted to. She could be directed. And then that performance could be taken and put uh, on a, a digital version of herself really without you knowing. And then we were able to have more freedom for the zero gravity element. Uh, it also, because we were using that technique, we ended up using it for all four of our actors that were in space uh, because we weren't then spending a lot of time on very difficult uh, uh, stunts and special effects rigs. Um, there were certain limitations you get to wire rigs, whether it's on a track or being manually um, pivoted and, and that can suck up a lot of a shoot day. Since we had this technique at our, at our side, we took some of the more complicated moves and just went fully digital with that shot all of our actors with uh, the facial performance. Um, and then virtual camera was a big deal. We'll talk about that a little bit later as well. But uh, in pre-production, we were able to take the early designs of what our sets were going to be and have our DP you know, pick up a virtual camera and walk through the set and see how he was going to shoot each scene. And there were a couple of times where we noticed what we were building wasn't going to work. Uh, he could sit there and say, you know, I need to get this coverage for this very important drama scene. And yeah. This wall has got to go. You know, either make the set bigger or make it flyable, and those were important moments to discover early, so we didn't have to delay production. To you know, see how many times we've we seen somebody have to bring the saws on and cut a set because we got to get this thing in there. We figured that out before we even start building the set, and the DP was able to find the, the basic angles he wanted to use and figure out if it was handheld or or on a certain steady cam, uh, so that when we got to shooting a couple months later, it was all kind of planned out. Yeah. And, special effects, uh, production design, stunts, um, everyone weigh in in the beginning, even the editorial, to figure out what the coverage was gonna be, what, what elements had to be done by each department and set that plan so when we got down to shooting it, it went pretty much like clockwork. And there's always gonna be some pivots on the day, but um, they can be really expensive when it's on a, a big shoot day with a big crew and expensive actors on set. And we were able to avoid, I think, a lot of those by planning ahead of time with everyone. That's great. Um, well, let's take a look from the Earth to the Cosmos video. It's great. Um, Greg, I would love to ask, like, what were some of the initial challenges you faced um, on this and how did you and the team overcome them? There's a lot of a lot of things going on in, in, in what we just saw on the behind the scenes. I mean, I think that's really it. The, the heart of the value of all this, in, in my opinion, is that there's a lot going on in these productions, and you've got you've got different, um, you know, cooks in the kitchen with with great ideas. You know, very expensive and accomplished people bringing what they bring to the table, including the actors. And some of these techniques help make that easier. We, we, we just talked about um, uh, in that video. We had multiple actors performing zero gravity stunts while also in a very dramatic moment. And that's very difficult to do with a lot of rigging and camera moves and, and one actor having to play off another and having the ability to use some of the virtual production techniques like fish performance capture, where you can, you can block some of it, you can do some of it with, with digital faces. That was a way to overcome having to spend days trying to get just the right moment, um, especially on a, on a big set, you know, 10 feet up in the air. Um, and the virtual camera work, again, the collaboration early on was a big way we avoided some of the challenges that would come up. Um, knowing that production design was building something that the director of photography could work with and that um, the actors were gonna be blocked in a way where they could be lit properly and we weren't gonna get overheated. And being able to see all of that and see the whole movie really up front and make a game plan that was easy for all of us to follow through shoot 
uh, made it just so cost effective and, and time efficient. Um, That's great. Uh, you know, the other thing watching this video, uh, some folks, especially some producers, might feel like it added astronomical costs to your production. Is that true? No, not really. Again, I, I think a lot of what we spent in the digital production and virtual production budgets was really transferring costs from post into prep. Um, and there were a few additional costs to, to take previs more than, and, and we'll talk about visualization in a moment, but um, to add some of the, the virtual camera work. But I think that more than paid for itself in being able to collaborate uh, where we didn't have uh, one plan that then had to pivot in four different directions with different departments uh, weighing in after the fact. So something where we could all figure it out together uh, and, and kind of march along. So uh, the, the, the big cost that you see that the dollar amounts that stick out for hardware or for additional labor, you really look at it as a whole um, and how that's paying for itself over the cost of the production. We can find that these aren't really very expensive techniques. It's just a, a way to look at a cost center up front versus yeah. kind of down the road and post. You're sort of shifting the buckets in, in a different time when they're being released. Yeah. And, right. and honestly, and that that is just so invaluable because you get to post a lot of times you shoot something and then you have to figure it out and post. We're figuring it out together, not just yeah. together. You know. Is it tough though? You know, you you have that's a different way of working. So is it tough for for folks to sort of adopt that that process when they're used to like, wait, I'm not going to release that money or, you know, we're not going to kick that off until weeks from now. So how yeah. does that sort of play yeah. out? How, how do you, how do you work? How do you adjust that? I mean, I'm going, I'm going through it right now, as you know, um, it, it is, it, it's, it's not, it's not something we're used to yet spending that much money up front. You know, you, you have a movie, um, uh, this is one I'm on right now where it's, there's a long development period. And usually that's sort of a cash flow, a little bit here, a little bit there, and you ramp up as you get closer. Right now, we're spending huge chunks of money right away because we got to buy machines and build infrastructure. And it's you have to you really have to be able to take a step back and look at the whole project and go, I get it. I get why we're spending it now. And you're also committing early. You know, a lot of times studios will say, Great, we're gonna make the movie, but we don't want to spend too much this year. We're gonna spend most of it next year. And you say, I gotta spend it now, they really gotta commit. And yeah. You know, that, that is kind of a, a hurdle that, that we go through. But I think the more it's being used, the more we're starting to see the efficiencies and the value of it. Uh, hopefully that just gets a little bit easier. As yeah. Well. But I can see that that's like really a, uh, a little bit of a leap, a little bit of a hard um, obstacle to, to, to climb over is to really get that understanding about the budget, about the, the um, when the budget uh, cash flow is going to happen at what period of time and how soon. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a leap of faith, uh, you know, for a lot of executives and, uh, and filmmakers, um, you know, so it, it kind of comes down to, to trust in your, in your HODs, that you know, they know what they're talking about and that this is going to work. Um, and, you know, we're, we're drawing, the great thing about virtual production, uh, I don't want to suck up too much time here, is the more people that are getting involved in it, um, you know, smart people are coming up with new ideas and new ways of doing it. We're starting to see um, the, the, the end product of that and, and say, great, that was, look what they did there. That was amazing. I would do that here. So there's more for execs to, to kind of see as reference and feel a little bit better about making those commitments up front. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Greg. Um, I want to go ahead and um, kick us off over to, to Sophia, you and talk about visualization now. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about what the third floor does. Some folks know of the third floor, um, can you speak to that for us? Yeah, sure. So, you know, visualization is really just a process of creating a blueprint for productions to help them, you know, determine how they're going to shoot things, what they're going to shoot. You know, it, it's a form of both storytelling and a planning tool for directors uh, and their shows, whether, you know, they're making a huge blockbuster feature film or like, uh, you know, trying to plan out one complex sequence in their indie film uh, to help them understand, you know, what their what what kind of uh, things are they going to uh, run into when they actually get on set. Um, so visualization, you know, on a technical level, includes working with uh, CG cameras, lighting, effects, uh, characters, animation. So it really covers. Uh, quite a bit of um, uh, technical work, 
but at its core, it's meant to be a tool to help us collaborate. You know, our goal at Third Floor is always to collaborate together with productions, uh, with directors, DP, stunt biz team, or you know, whatever uh, departments that might be like involved in this process, um, and help them basically help everyone get on the same page about what the plan is for shooting. So you know, on the previs end, it's a really amazing tool to help people kind of like. Uh, visualize exactly what's going to happen on set because I think one of the major problems that productions face is you know as you're preparing for shoot day um, you know you there are so many creatives on set uh, everyone could have a slightly idea a different idea of like what they're looking at or what they're thinking like that set will look like um, you know I've definitely encountered uh, directors and producers having completely different ideas of what you know the initial shoot day will look like and then once we present them with some previs then everyone kind of comes together and says like oh yeah here's here's um, the kind of end goal that we're all aiming for so you know visualization it includes previs it also includes post viz where we're overlaying CG elements onto plates that have already been shot and it includes uh, tech viz and virtual production which is really just the process of kind of um, uh, taking a look at a uh, previs that you've already done or maybe certain types of shots, maybe complex ones, maybe ones with CG characters and you know, kind of figuring out uh, what are the logistics of shooting this? What kind of cameras are we gonna need? What kind of cranes do we need motion capture? Is that something we want? Or maybe is that something that we decide uh, is not suitable for our production? So it's really, our goal is entirely to help productions uh, plan out their shoots far in advance or, you know, when when you go into reshoots or post-production, um, help with the process of like crafting the story. Right. And and I mean, really, you're what you're describing is a, is a visual communication toolkit, you know, for everyone. Like we see it, we understand it together. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think of the number of times that um, people, even people, uh, you know, are describing like a certain CG character or a monster, um, you show them an image, everyone instantly understands, right? Because a uh, picture speaks a thousand words. Um, and that's basically what visualization is for yeah. productions. So what are some like common misconceptions about previs? Um, like it's only for high budgeted films. Or maybe like yeah, you're doing the work twice. Definitely. Yeah, I think that one of the biggest misconceptions is people thinking, well, why would I pay to recreate my movie or, you know, game or TV show twice because I already know what I'm going to shoot. Uh, so I don't really need any of this like uh, uh, previs or any like form of visualization. Um, but I think the point that some people need to remember is that, uh, you know, previs or visualization is not there to, is not there to completely drive the creative process. It's just there to help people get on the same page and help you plan out, you know, help you identify issues early on with what you want to shoot. Uh, whether that's a complicated car chase sequence or adding in a gigantic monster that destroys a city, um, you know, you can really identify a lot of problems that are going to happen in the shoot process way before you ever get to set when you decide to add visualization to your process. And it's not, it's meant to help the creative process, help bolster it. So, you know, people can look at the previous and say like, oh, you know what, like, that's not the color that we wanted. We all said blue, but now we have 10 different types of blue. So let's let's see all these different versions and then decide on which color blue we want, right? Yeah. So it's not, it's not, um, it's not a tool that's going to cost you money because you're going to save so much money in the beginning of the process by making these decisions early on instead of having to deal with it in post. And I'm sure we've all joked, uh, just fix it in post. Well, you can also address it in pre <laughs> and then not worry about the post problems. Avoid the fix, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, you know, it sounds like it's a huge impact on production and scheduling. Greg, I mean, how, where have you seen that um, help you in terms of production and scheduling? I mean, and you know, visualization, there are different aspects of it. A lot of people talk about pitch biz where you're, you're putting a pretty um, animation together. But really, I think uh, what Sophia was talking about is right. A lot of uh, pre viz and tech viz is really a problem solver. Um, so it may not just be for monster movies or big car chase sequences. It could be for, you know, a tricky camera movie you want to do or a location that's difficult to shoot the scene in and you have to figure out how you're going to do it. It's an easy way to, to put that into a way we can all see it and, and talk about it and, and try some different ideas before we go out there and shoot it and see if that's going to work. Um, and uh, I won't jump ahead of myself. There's some, some other things we'll talk about in a moment where you can go to a location before you shoot and use the previs and kind of see if it's going to work. And if it's not, it's good to know now before you get the whole crew out there and, and block off the streets. So it's, it's really a problem solving thing uh, um, more than anything else. It's great to have for, for buzz reels and for, you know, um, everyone to kind of wrap their heads around how great the movie's going to be. But for the filmmakers, I think the, the value is, is planning ahead and avoiding problems, avoiding fixes. Yeah. Um, I know yeah. we have another, um, and, oh, go ahead. Sorry. So oh, Christina, I just wanted to add one thing, which is, uh, yes, there is a misconception that, you know, they're looking at, I think some productions are looking at these massive Hollywood blockbusters with like billions of dollars under their belt and thinking, oh, you know, that's not really cost effective for us to add this whole additional, like part of the pipeline onto our workflow. Um, but, you know, Provis can really encompass a lot of things. It could just be uh, you know, a short sequence in which you have like a particularly like more complicated camera move, you want to make something like more beautiful or more epic, you know, previous can help plan out some of those shots. Uh, it's not just about big blockbuster films. It's a very uh, versatile tool that can be scaled down or scaled up depending on like whatever the needs of the production are. Right. So I know we have another um, area we want to cover, which is simulcam. Um, and you know, this, there's another, uh, video here from third floor on the Cyclops video. We can, we'll play it without any sound. And if you want to just explain, um, the use of it and, and how you use it over at the third floor. Sure. You know, uh, I think a bunch of us have already kind of covered this concept of being able to like pick up an iPad and, you know, see your CG elements. Uh, in real time. And that's what Cyclops is for the third floor, um, which I know a lot of companies have their own like proprietary software uh, uh, to be able to do this kind of thing. This is just third floor's version of it. Um, but, you know, what's really amazing about this is you think some things, just like I mentioned before, sometimes you run into problems or issues on production um, that can really like hold you back in terms of you know, your ability to shoot, your ability to story tell, but, you know, you suddenly have this um, piece of technology, which is very, very simplified down by the time it gets in the creative's hands. And we all know, like, uh, creative directors or other creatives, like, on set, they don't want to think about all those, like, technical barriers to what they're trying to create, right? Like, they just want to create something cool, they want to create something moving. So let's say you have, you know, a uh, giant monster like we have here with our Cyclops creature. Um, you, you know, being able to pick up your iPad, go to a set and see how your uh, monster like fits in that area that you're interested in shooting in is going to help you define like so many things uh, for the actual shoot day. You know, uh, it, I'd say one of the most common things is people uh, pick it up and say like, oh, you know, I know we said the monster's going to be 50 feet and now it doesn't even fit in frame or like, how are we going to compose it if there's a little girl who's only like three feet tall and we want to have the monster in the same frame. So suddenly you can kind of start to problem solve some of these things, just like Greg said, uh, way ahead of the shoot um, and, you know, make some of those big creative decisions. Like, you know what, like, let's make this monster like smaller or, you know, let's find a different location to shoot. Uh, and you don't, you definitely don't want to already be in post-production when you're realizing some of these issues, whether it's, you know, your, um, your design of your CG elements or, or the location you're shooting at, or even like the lighting, the colors, like if, 
you know, I think a lot of us have been in that situation where you go in to the editorial room, you see the shots cut together and you realize, oh, this is not quite what I had imagined. You know, the integration of the footage that we shot with the CG characters um, isn't quite working the way we expected. So you have some technology like Simulcam, you're solving those problems way ahead of, in, way ahead of time. And then by the time you get to editorial, you're like, this is exactly what we planned, you know, ideally, ideally. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Greg, you were you were smiling at uh, the point of like, you know, surprise, yeah. uh, you know, experience on set. So I think you have a story here. Flashbacks. Oh, oh, so many, so many. But but in general, yeah, I mean, we've been through that so many times where, um, you know, when, when something isn't actually there, it's hard, even if you, you're like, I've seen the previous, I understand what it's going to be. There's a, there's a big thing back there or this environment, it's this beautiful landscape that I don't have yet. It's hard for anyone to, to give space for that when they don't know exactly where it is. And the tennis ball on a stick only goes so far, especially if you have a $20 million actor and you really want to just shoot that actor doing their bit. But you have to remember to leave room for all the stuff that's going to be back there. So Simon Kim's a great way to just on the spot, you know, just say, look, this is what you're shooting, but also make sure you've got that 30 foot thing back there in camera. Because if you don't, we have to rebuild that whole world just to fit it in. And that's a huge cost. Yeah. And it won't look as good as if you just shoot it the right way the first time. So it's a, it's a huge way to avoid problems like that. And I've also seen, um, like you said, places where we've moved entire locations because you get there early and you go, oh, that's not going to work. Yeah. I can't do this thing or that thing. And, and now instead of blocking off a whole city street for a weekend, we move into a different location. Uh, really expensive problems are avoided if you can just kind of lens it up early and go, oh, wow, didn't think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and another really issue awesome is have, sorry, Sophia. Oh, go ahead. Another issue we have as cinematographers is just lighting. So now you can actually put in an AR object and you where you know with ray tracing, we can suddenly start changing the light and we can figure out that you know what we could we can't put those cherry pickers in the scene where we've got we're gonna put them on location. Okay, we're gonna have to switch everything around. And all of a sudden you're talking about a day's shoot that could cost, you know, at minimum two hundred thousand. You don't wanna waste two hundred thousand of the production money. So um, it's a great tool to have to just reduce those small mistakes so you can easily um, uh, easily not see when you're planning and you're talking with a team who's used to working in front of a computer and then you have a, a floor team of filmmakers who are used to um, being on location. We don't often speak the same language, so this is why it's so great. Yeah. It, has there been a, a situation either for, for uh, you, Yannicka, or even Greg and, and Sophia where um, clients or uh, folks that you're working with on a production, you realize, wow, uh, we, sh we should have started previs earlier or we didn't um, start so soon enough. Um, I don't know if you've had that experience, Sophia, where in the, in the process, it was just a little bit late, maybe. I mean, I certainly have. Uh, there are you know, some shows where you, you just need a lot of previs, a lot, a lot of different scenes that have to be figured out. Um, one thing I've run into a few times is you, you can't just do it all linearly. A lot of times you have to do a lot of it up front so they can all finish on time. And oftentimes halfway through the previs detectives process, you're kind of running up against, we're, we're gonna start you know, building sets and shooting soon and we haven't figured it all out yet. Um, but I've also seen the other way where you, know, you, you put, um, start with let's previs everything. And it's not always the right fit with uh, with a with a filmmaker, whether it's a director or a studio exec or producer, a lot of times you start spending that money and you're previsioning some great stuff, but if it's not, you know, used in conjunction with the filmmaker, if they're kind of like, ah, I want to deal with it, you guys just previs it, then it's then it can be kind of you know a waste. You know, like you, you spent the money, it looks great, but they're going to go shoot something else. Uh, I've seen the same thing with Simulcam. You know, you can put that technology together and it's amazing. But if you get a director to show up on the day and go, you know what, I don't want to shoot that. I'm going to shoot this instead. So it's, it, it is, all this technology um, is wonderful, uh, but it, it's also something we should keep in mind is pairing it with the right filmmakers. Because if they're not going to embrace it, you know, you don't want to put a big spend up front and then, and then pivot away from it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sophia. Um, um, next up, we're going to uh, touch on performance capture. Um, we also wanted to show you another, uh, another technique 
Uh, this basically branches over a multitude of things, including motion capture and facial capture. And uh, Mariana Acuna, is, is her, her company, Glassbox, uh, has taken a lot of strides in the virtual production world. They have a product called Dragonfly, which um, basically is their company's virtual camera tool. So we're going to go ahead and play this video from Away uh, that features uh, Dragonfly. Um, I'd love for you to expand a little bit more on the technology on Glassbox and what you, where have you seen it just being super useful for filmmakers? Oh yeah, absolutely. So yeah, around five years ago, uh, my co-founder and I just saw really the potential of virtual production. And we re what we realized is like they were not off the shelf solutions. So just something that was plug and play that you need engineers or you know, know about networking and latency and all of this. So what we wanted is just give the opportunity to where you were in a in a real professional, you know, volume or whether you wanted to do <laughs> mocap in your living room or in the pool, we just wanted to make it accessible really easy. Like our whole goal was like democratizing the tools because there's, you know, from the very beginning is this idea of like, oh, you need a massive budget to start creating content. And so, you know, Dragonfly is just like, we've always uh, started explaining it as your window into, you know, like your magic window into your virtual world. And we made it so that not only you can use a game vice, but you could also use a game, um, an Xbox controller, a Sony PlayStation controller, or you can just your own screen controls, like however you want to, because the idea is just like, however you used to have a workflow on set, on your live action set, every tool we've ever built is with that idea in mind. I come from like hardcore visual effects on set. Um, and co-founder comes from like hardcore game engine. So I think between, you know, both of us, it was like a, a really, a really good mix, you know, a really good mix there. And then yeah. of course you can record and review. You can go back to any positions in your virtual scenes. You can even kind of start shooting from the point of view of any animated camera, right? So kind of like an over the shoulder or like an aerial scene, but you can just, hook it up to anything that's in your scene. You can also be in virtual reality and you can use it for blocking animation, for doing virtual location scouting. So, you know, Sophia and, and Greg were talking about how important this is to really start knowing where things are before you even start previewing it and shooting it, et cetera. Um, and yeah, so so that's, the, the, and the reason why we did it with uh, cross-platform with Unreal and Maya, because we also realized that one of the barriers to entry was, okay, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a content creator, but I, so I want to start using it, but maybe I, you know, I have a, a friend that is like my asset builder and he does everything in Maya, or maybe, you know, I, I know how to use Unreal and the stuff on the marketplace, but those two intertwine and that import and export process was like really complicated, really mm -hmm. cumbersome. So that yeah. if you're just in the iPad, the director, the cinematographer, the content creator, it's in the iPad, just visualizing. And then whether it's a Unreal Engine technical artist or the IMI artist, doing their changes and you're able to visualize that regardless of what software you're in, then you're, you know, we're just giving them kind of like uh, an, an upper hand and, and kind of reduce that barrier of entry and that like being, being afraid of just jumping into virtual production. Yeah, that's great. Um, I've, uh, you know, played around and it's very easy to use. I love watching Norman <laughs> messing around. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about how um, defining motion capture is the process of recording the movements of objects or people. And so what is, how would you describe the difference between using motion capture versus using facial capture? Yeah, so in virtual production and, you know, when we show the, the next video, it'll be even more obvious. But when you're doing um, performance, uh, performance capture, this means that you're gonna be, as you're saying, recording the movements of the body, the motion. And at the same time, you may or may not be recording the, the facial capture as well. So the facial performance, uh, you can think of it like when an, when an actor is acting, you know, in, in a live action set, well, of course, everything is happening at the same time. You know, they're acting, all the emotions are there, the body is there, but because it, you know, this is a per performance capture, the, depending, it, and it really depends on what you're doing. It, you may be doing it for previous, so you may not need the facial capture. And that's why at, at a certain shoot, you may or may not be doing both at the same time. And so facial capture, if uh, anybody that has sent an emoji with, you know, with their iPhone, so basically that's facial capture. The camera on the phone is just, you know, capturing and analyzing all of your movements. Um, and it's your 
just of the movements of your face and it's just mirroring those expressions and then just putting it in an emoji and then it produces an animoji because it's just basically an animated emoji right so in the most <laughs> simplest terms that is facial capture um and sometimes why you do it separately is because for example uh uh the avengers right hulk so mark ruffalo is a hulk but it may very well be that you don't need Matt Ruffalo for a, like a lot of the scenes because it may be an, a, a stunt doing, you know, a, a, a bunch of like the really difficult jumps and stuff like that. And so they're recording the body at a different session and all the, you know, the body performance at a different session. And then of course, then for the facial performance for capturing and being able to translate real Mark Ruffalo's, you know, acting into Hulk, so like Hulk is, a lot more believable they may do the facial capture you know in a separate in a separate session but you may also do it at the same time awesome okay so we have a video here it's uh it's glassbox's live client that we're going to show here and um we'll go ahead and play it and you can talk through exactly what's happening here because you're specializing in facial capture as well as meta human um characters so uh, as we play it, maybe you could describe it for those that are just lame, you know, a little bit light on the technology tech. Part <laughs> Absolutely, <of it. laughs> I'll just leave it. I'll just leave it in the animoji. So basically, our live client solution uh, for Unreal Engine is a higher end tool than the animoji. It's a more professional tool than the animoji, but the concept is pretty much the same. So you know, we're you you we're doing the facial motion capture, and it's animating and tracking all the facial movements, and then streaming it, you know, kind of like what you're saying right now and streaming it live real time into um, into the game engine, into a real engine. So with live client, you can basically perform or drive any virtual characters so to this. And so this means that animation professionals can start testing and reviewing uh, facial animations live, which is not only a lot of fun, but it also saves like huge amounts of, you know, time with iterations between like traditional production teams. And in this case, you can also even go a step further, say you are in virtual reality and you have the talent acting, like you can really get like up close and personal with your virtual characters and really start checking how those, you know, facial expressions, uh, the high frequency details, so, you know, all the nuances that make our emotions of the human face, you can really get in there and start taking decisions and change things around. And because it's all, you know, happening live, well, Again, as we've all been talking about this, it's just so important to make decisions earlier rather than later. Um, and something that's really cool as well with like client is that you can drive the same virtual camera, that the same virtual character with you know different uh, with different actors, and different talent, or vice versa. You can have the same talent drive all kinds of different virtual characters. So it's kind of like you know it's it's really opening up all the all the possibilities. Um, and your actors can jump in live and just um, do different sessions live, either exactly. live or you can do it recorded similarly to mocap. Yeah, exactly. And you can even use any, you know, recorded input as well, any, any other like media that you already have to drive that. Um, and just to find out, I just want to quickly want to mention about um, the, 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 the fellowship of um, Unreal, Unreal Engine. Yeah. Um, because... Uh, epic and so that this is one of the shorts created on this on this fellowship um so the, the whole fellowship started because um epic games when the when the pandemic started a lot of people were out of work and they decided to do something about it so they started this program in uh april end of april 2020 so they got to it like right away and so it's basically to really teach people about virtual production and everything that we've been discussing. Uh, well, maybe not the in-camera visual effects, of course, but everything else that we've been talking about here. And it's really impressive because so it started in the pandemic and then it's been, we've had over 425 people go through the program uh, from over 20 countries, all kinds of different industries and specialties um, 105 women total right now, yay, and trying to get even more women. And with this amount of graduates, that means that there has been, with 425 graduates, there's, there's been two minutes per film. And that equates to 14 hours, 14 plus hours of content or the equivalent of eight animated films. So, you know, I think this is also a way where um, 
producers in the audience can see how this saves, you know, time, costs, energy, etc. Yeah, that's great. And where do you see the technology growing for productions? Um, well, I mean, more and more wanting, you know, we're going to use this your live client. We're going to, we want to leverage this technology. Yeah, of course. I mean, just the facial, uh, just the facial capture industry alone is going to have a growth of around, you know, twelve percent in the upcoming years. And this is because, I mean, and I think as well as, you know, in-camera visual effects. So I think performance capture and in-camera visual effects is what's gonna have the most growth. Uh, and the pandemic already accelerated this to the max. There's so many stages that were built around the world. And it's also because, you know, the content that we are creating, it's being distributed and produced and consumed in so many different ways, right? Like you have the VTubers, you have the digital influencers, you have, VR, AR, volumetric capture, you know, of course, gaming, the streaming services wars, et cetera. So there's such, so I, I see so much growth and, you know, potential for opportunities in these areas, for sure. That's great. Thank you so much, Mariana, for sharing. Um, we're going to cover real quick also um, volumetric capture, which is technology that uh, converts a person, object, or place into a 3D digital data and reproduces it into a high quality image. And so um, we have a clip here from Jenny Ogden, who is the COO and co-founder of 4D Fun. There, she's got a volumetric capture studio and, and it's a disruptive technology company specializing in 4D performance capture, VR, spatial computing, AI, and NFT. So we're, I'm gonna um, chat with you, Yannicka, about your experience, because it's a combination of not only um, experimenting with virtual production, but also you have extensive onset experience, um, especially leveraging this technology um, as well. So please, can you uh, tell us a little bit about um, the different ways you're using virtual production um, and what kinds of techniques do you find yourself often uh, working in? Absolutely. Um... I think the thing I love with virtual production is um, it gives me the ability to um, visit locations I physically can't go and visit. Uh, one obviously being space, uh, fantastic for <laughs> sci-fi locations. Um, the thing I love about it is that um, most of the tools I work with are very friendly to a cinematographer. Right now, there is a, a what should I say? It's like a tech threshold. So I still feel like I'm the interpreter between you know the DP, the elder generation of DPs who are used to working analog, to um, my generation, and shall we go down to Gen Zs who are coming into filmmaking and creating fantastic movies. Um, there is a slight tech threshold right now, but we're trying to equalize us so that you can go from uh, hand holding an ARRI camera to then operating a virtual camera. Um, and that's what I kind of love with that is that this sort of it's it's becoming seamless, and that's what's so interesting is that when I step onto a virtual set, I have the freedom to use any tool I want. Like my budget as a cinematographer is limitless. Um, previously, I would write up a wish, wish list and I would submit my wish list to the producer, and the producer would go no, <laughs> and stroke <laughs> off you know sixty percent of what's on that list. Uh, whilst here, you know, I can put up any kind of lights, I can have a cherry picker, I can have a dolly, I can have a grip, I can have any camera, I can have multiple cameras, I can have the exact um, anamorphic lenses I want to use because I want the lens flare. Um, so I've got the option of doing anything without spending a single dollar from the production. This is why I love it. It is... As a cinematographer, you are spoiled, um, but also because we are in this in-between stage or sort of trying to figure out where virtual production belongs in the film production. Yeah. Um, you also have to sort of coordinate with the DP as well and, and try and speak the same language and, and the film sets that I worked on has been really important to bring everybody on really early people who aren't um, in, in on the production already during previous, typically the DP and the editor. Uh, and the visual effects supervisor and just bringing everyone together. Yeah. Um, so can you, can you share a little bit, you know, you've already touched on, you don't have to touch the budget. Um, what are, are there specific tools that you like, or you're like, I just like to use all the tools that I have at my fingertip and, and how, how, how easy is that to, 
to, for someone who might be a cinematographer who doesn't have any experience in that? Um, I think I need to bring it back to the floor again, because for us who are used to working on the floor and there is a set hierarchy of who can touch what, who can look at what and who can say what and do what. And, uh, you know, everybody has an opinion when you're on set. So every DP hates to have multiple monitors because everybody has something to say. Yeah. Um, what is so magnificent with working with virtual production and working in the previous is that everybody does have something to say, but everybody has a valid point to give. You know, so I think it's all about uh, me as a DP not being overprotective of my role, but recognizing that this is a holistic workflow and working at one with the set and actually gives me even more opportunities to explore my movie and make it as good as it can possibly be. And there's no nothing is left open ended. We have worked out all the problems before we meet them. Like Sophia, you I, I actually wrote down your quote because, you know, we're addressing the problems in the pre production rather than addressing them and fixing them in post production. And it's it's absolutely changed my world. Yeah, that's great. So we have a video from your from Stowaway uh, behind the scenes that we can play um, through. And if you want to just sort of describe what the the work was and what tools and and whatnot that you were able to leverage. Correct. So there's no audio here. So uh, I just starting with opening up from images from Stowaway, so we all know which movie we're talking about. Um, now, the biggest issue with Stowaway was, of course, it's taking place uh, on a elliptical orbit to Mars. So our location is moving rapidly in space. But not only that, we have this issue of a rotating spaceship that's creating uh, simulated gravity. So here we have everybody together, all has a department, editor, Ryan, Joe Penn, a director, he's on the virtual camera, the V-cam. You've got Clemens Becker, the DP, and you've also got Jorgen, who's a VFX supervisor. And we're all like, okay, so when we're in the control module, can we actually see the rocket booster fly past us, connect to the MTS, so the, the spaceship, can we see it acting as a counterweight, so people understand that it's going to start spinning, and then we're going to have simulated gravity. Also, the point of view from Zoe, um, played by Anna Kendrick, can she actually see the physics happening? Can she see that the rocket booster is connecting to the spaceship? Um, or do we have to redesign uh, redesign the set build? Do we have to redesign the control module here? Um, here we are on the tethers between um, the two modules, the crew module and the rocket booster. Um, and then we are approaching uh, zero gravity, which is really messed with us, everybody in the crew. Uh, <laughs> Here we discovered that there is nothing that exists currently in film production that can operate in zero G. So if there is no gravity, uh, you can see I'm getting pretty creative in the way that I'm uh, flipping that virtual camera around um, because <laughs> as you can see, the set is rotating slowly twice a minute, but is also rotating in zero G, which meant we had to flip all the controls upside down and then back to regular mode and it started getting really complicated and we got super lost <laughs> many times. Uh, here you can see Joe Penna. What I love with it is that the director can become intimate with the camera moves and he's just getting more and more creative. Um, here you can see our editor Ryan work with Joe. Um, and what I also loved is that we're editing the movie at the same time as we're shooting the previews. So we all know now what we're going to get when we're on set. So, so by this time, by the fifth path, pass, you know, when we move into the studio, the entire team is an old married couple. It's like we've worked together for years. We know exactly what we're doing and everybody wants to achieve the same goal. There, there's no differences anymore. We all know what we want to achieve and everybody is happy that they're performing their best yeah. once we move on to set. Did it take some time for the crew to sort of get used to this? Like how, how, was there some resistance? Oh yeah. Um, and, and how? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I do feel like, um, you know, um, I, I mean, I started out as a 3D cinematographer, uh, stereographer, you know, making 3D films. And it's, it's kind of the same resistance. I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. It kind of feels like you're trying to knock on someone's door and convert them to a new religion. Um, but honestly, it does, it does make your life better. Um, and the fun thing was to work with Clemens Becker, who is an exceptional, amazing camera operator. Um, I absolutely idolize his work. He would not touch a virtual rig. 
he would not touch it until I think week end of week three and then finally he was like okay let me let me have a go let me have a play and he fell in love with it immediately and understood how intuitive it was and how um he thought that it wouldn't feel real you know yeah. that um the gravity of the objects wouldn't bounce according to f- the feel of real life a dolly movement wouldn't feel the same as sitting on a dolly when it actually does yeah. um so yeah. those are yeah the, we're getting really really close to real life which yeah. is amazing yeah is that like what would you say is some of the hardest things for crews to grasp um virtual production on set is it the like the weight of you know camera rig or or whatnot, or is it other like uh, you know the technology sort of is different? From I would what say I'm it's using. the opposite. It's it's almost the surprise of the virtual crew who's maybe just sort of like post production or com- computer based coming onto a real set and realizing how many things need to operate and move at the same time, how big a dolly actually is, how yeah. dangerous some of the rigs we have and wires can be, how dangerous a, a film set actually can be uh, for people who are not used to uh, working on a floor and why we have rules set in place and hierarchy set in place. I think that is probably the biggest um, the biggest issue that I see in virtual production uh, the, the and, and the virtual production who understands that you need to reset yeah. uh, and reset the action and be ready to go immediately. Yeah. And reset all the technology. Does the communication um, on set change um, bet- amongst people? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I can use, I, I'll, I'm going to use still way as an example. Uh, in the beginning, uh, it was sort of like... It, difficult to understand who was who was top dog on set because suddenly we realized like oh do you know on the floor the dp is a top dog but here actually it's more special effects driven but then after a while we understood okay well is it the the director has nothing to say now because there's no actors delivering lines uh but then the editor should be top dog because he's actually editing um Mm. but i think what we figured out eventually after you know battling it forwards and back and trying to figure out who's top dog when is that certain scenes have different sensitivity right so certain scenes the actors have priority certain scenes the technology have priority certain scenes uh especially in a sci-fi the physics have priority um and eventually not eventually but i think after a second pass everybody was on the same page and could understand why certain decisions had been made so then that wasn't a battle we had to take when we came on to set or into post-production yeah yeah that's amazing um i'm so so excited i I (laughs) go on set and visit you um so you know you're pushing boundaries in virtual production for the future um, I'd love for you to share expand about just expand a little bit more about your work with aviation and space and what you see for the future. Oh, absolutely. I think um, virtual production has opened up this new world where where um, science and filmmaking uh, are coming together. Uh, and the field that I find is really interesting is commercial space flight and commercial aviation. Um, we're seeing the need. Um, uh, of course, everything is rooted down and, uh, you know, rooted to money is that now that everybody's competing for those same government grants, we need to bring the public on board and understand, you know, where the tax dollars being spent. And what we are seeing in commercial space flight is that there is a need to communicate and a need to integrate the film community. And what's so much fun for me is now that we have virtual photography or virtual productions is how do I make these tools that were designed for a film studio to actually work in zero G? So now we need to rethink everything yet again, but we're working closer and closer with the engineers, you know, with the scientists. And I love the fact that we're uh, elevating the amazing work the scientists are doing now, and we're bringing it into the main market. And that's really where you see social, social media has really lifted the visual language. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm very excited to see uh, how things develop for you, especially in space. Um, We're gonna now, um, we have time for Q&A. We're gonna move to the Q&A. And um, I know some folks have dropped some um, questions in. Um, Let's start off real quick and um, panelists, please jump in. 
uh, on any of these questions, but, um, and some of them are specific to, to certain folks, but I'd love to open up with, can you share some war stories that might be cautionary tales that, um, that folks can be aware of when um, utilizing virtual production? Uh, you know, uh, and the, the only negative one I, I can really share is we did have a, a particular production where a lot of uh, money was spent on shiny new tools that seemed great on paper, but wasn't a really good match for the filmmaker. And so by the time we had prepped everything and gotten out to set with all the actors on, on stage and in the um, meticulous plans of how we were going to choreograph everything with Simulcam, uh, and we had a director that just didn't want to use what we had pre-baked and pre-set and planned on and wanted to go a different way, suddenly all that technology was just pushed to the side and we just went back to old school live shooting. Yeah. Um, but timeless, um, or, uh, endless amounts of times I have absolutely seen the need for some kind of pre-planning when you get on a set and you discover something on an expensive, you know, full crew, big rented location, shut down street day that you could have probably avoided as you planned a little bit beforehand. So um, I definitely think that all these techniques are absolutely valuable. Uh, you just kind of have to look at your particular production and your particular filmmakers and go, well, where can we use these things? Where would this be beneficial to us? Yeah, yeah. Any other war stories? Um, I mean, I can share. I can share one where I, I thought it was pretty funny. We were the, um, giving a demo to this uh, director that I shall not mention uh, of all of our different tools. And then he was like, okay, fantastic. So I want you to do this. And he just described it like basically a whole war scene, but he wanted us to do everything, but he didn't want to pay for anything when it came to the asset building. And he was like, no, 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 like, yes, there's all these assets that are free in, you know, in the marketplace or the asset store. But like you still need to, you know, you, you need to pay for the virtual art department. You need to pay for the asset building. No, 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 I don't want anything. Else. Like we showed him stuff that was free. We were like, yeah, sure, we'll do, we, we can do this because, you know, the assets are free. And he basically wanted us to build a, a whole scene, do the whole kind of like previous, um, just for him to convince other people to fund his film. But he wanted to pay nothing for the, you know, for the asset building. So, so no, there's still that part of, uh, there's still the virtual art department that still needs to happen. You know, there's still, there's a lot of free stuff, but if you want to build, you, you still need to pay for it and budget for it. <laughs> Great. Sophia, you said you were going to, you had a story. Yes. I'll add, I'll add up in my quick two cents, which is uh, we had done some very complex previs for a scene in which there were multiple CG characters running around and it all had to be timed exactly because it was somewhat of a, uh, uh, you know, like a dance number almost. Um, and there had to be certain, there were certain triggers on set for set props to be moving at certain times. And so it was a very complicated scene that, you know, the director loved, the uh, uh, production really loved and wanted to make it work. And then once they got on set, um, uh, they wanted to, there was some resistance to the pre-planning that had been done in terms of camera work. Mm. And so, uh, you know, there's always like a little bit of an initial period in which you need to like set up the camera and make sure that the timing is all working. And they, uh, on production, they decided they wanted to do it manually because I think, you know, I think Yannicka can especially speak to this, like as a DP, you know, there's that sensation that you want uh, the control over the camera. Um, and I think, you know, for the visualization side, all we want is to help production go smoothly. So because they want to do it manually, cross off like all the planning that had been done for that sequence, I think they spent about six hours on set to get a single shot because they felt that, you know, they really wanted their hands on it, um, but they could just not get the timing right because it was very, very like com uh, complex and detailed scene. So at the end, they finally relented and said, okay, let's give this, you know, this tech viz or this virtual production a try. Um, got it within like 30 minutes. So I would just say uh, they understood the importance of using the technology that was available to them afterwards. Awesome. <laughs> um, there's a question for you, Sophia, and um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask it if you know about what percentage of a VFX budget might 
Freeva's take on average? I don't know if you well, know. Yeah. You know, I'm sure the person doesn't want to hear this answer, but it depends. Uh, <laughs> I would say that Previs is probably the uh, lesser expensive portion of the uh, overall VFX budget. I mean, I'm sure Greg probably has a lot of insight into this, but it's because, you know, Previs is, uh, it's meant to be very versatile. It's like, it's agile, it's quick, you know, the previous budget can be as small or big as you want. Obviously, like we're looking at these major blockbuster films and thinking, wow, like the previous for that looks really detailed and complicated. But you know, um, I know that at least for a third floor, you can come to you can come to the company and say, well, this is the budget we have. How can we work together to like figure out what the needs are? And the previous doesn't have to be ultra high res effects and characters. It could be like a grayscale box if that's what you need for your show. You know, it's not about producing the best previous possible to impress people. It's about, well, what do you need it for? So previous could potentially take up a very small portion of the overall VFX budget. Um, it could take up a greater portion and potentially save you money uh, later down the line, you know, when you're actually going to post-production. If you already have everything in previous planned out, then Pretend, uh, ideally, you know, your post VFX, uh, you know, when you're working with final vendors is going to go much more smoothly. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, the previous money is basically it's, it's man hours and, and man weeks. So it's, it's, it's scalable to the production. The more you need, the more you're going to spend, but also it's going to have a, a, a relatively constant um, percentage of what the overall budget is going to be. So, you know, in general, it's less than 10% of the budget, um, usually much less than 10%. It just kind of depends on how much work you really need to figure out. Uh, and like you said, you know, how much money are you spending on, on you know, really good looking pitch bids, or are you just getting in there and blocking something out and putting a camera on it? Um, yeah. But the, yeah, it's really just yeah. about and you know, flavor. Yeah, I've worked on projects that, had, you know, a gigantic team with like 50 plus artists. I've also worked on teams where it was uh, me and one other person. So it's, uh, it's as scalable as you want it to be. Yeah, there's some, there's a few budget questions. Um, some that were already answered in the Q and A. Um, we're going to cover a bunch on our second session, which is August 31st. Uh, panel two is really going to be about budgeting, scheduling, and crewing. So make sure you join us then. Um, but so the other question was. Um, It'd be great to get a general perspective of how we should think about budgeting when every show or film is different. Um, is there, a, is there a, a pathway, is there a methodology that uh, could be used? I, this is probably more directed to, to Greg on this, on this question, but by all means, if um, the other panelists want to um, say anything to it. I mean, again, I think, and it's hard to say it depends, but it really does because there, there are such different techniques um, that, that can be used and every production is a bit of a snowflake. You know, it, whether there's an actor that's got an issue or, or a location or a filmmaker with a vision, um, it really kind of depends on what it is you're looking at and, and how to budget it. There's not really a, a template and say, you know, it's this percentage of your budget is going to be virtual production because it could be zero, um, you know, or, or it could be a lot if, you know, in certain projects where the whole thing is going to be on an LED volume. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's hard to say that there's a, um, you know, a general notion of what you should budget for these different techniques. Um, sorry to see yeah. <laughs> that's you could answer. <laughs> Let, let's, let's, uh, I'll ask this one here next. I, uh, it, it's slightly different in terms of lower budget. So maybe 5 million in and lower for independent productions. Um, trying to get in the space. What advice do you have about how to approach virtual production? Obviously, there's a bunch of different tools that we've shown tonight. Um, you know, is there a place that uh, that already has an infrastructure, pay like rental fees or or whatnot? Um, what what ways can lower budgeted films? What would your recommendation be for lower budgeted films to get into this space? Well, but but again, if you know, it's like, are you are you doing a full film? Are you doing a short film? Are you doing episodic? I mean, it it really it really depends because you can shoot it yourself. I mean, you can get a rococo rococo no rococo suit for you know like a thousand dollars 
you can basically get a GoPro in your face. You, so if you already have your virtual characters, you can download a bunch of assets for free. Like you have environments, you have like mega scans, you have Quixel. There now there's the meta human, so you can even have actors already that are rigged and have the face rigged. So you don't even have to spend money on like you can really go low budget, low budget. You know what I mean? So it really depends on what you're after. But I highly suggest that they look up this um, has the lull and, and battlefield because he has done so many videos and breakdowns on how to go like super, you know, low budget to maybe like middle ground. And he gives a lot of really like good tips on different techniques and. It also depends like if they're going to only be doing virtual camera because they want to do some freebies or do they want to do some photogrammetry get some drones you know it's just there are so many parts of this uh, you know what it's called virtual production so much so many te different technologies that it's that's why we can't answer questions like super specific in terms of budgets or places because it's so dependent on you know what what you're doing and exactly what you're doing it for yeah, and, and just like Glassbox, there's a lot of uh, software that's available to you for free. So like, you know, you- not free, but it's very affordable. <laughs> oh, sorry, but I know like uh, like uh, Unity, they have their cinematics, you know, the rope and beta, and you can download it for free and you can start playing around with it and start creating your previous and really understanding uh, and wrapping your head around how to work with, with the previous. Um, yeah, many tools available for you for, for very, very little money. Yeah. Yannick, Yannicka, there's a question here for you. Um, how troublesome is the more a problem to the cinematog cinematography? I mean, yes, if you're standing right next to the screen, you will get more a, uh, depending on the pixel pitch of your LED screens. I mean, uh, <laughs> how much can you afford? How far away from your set is this LED screen? Uh, I mean, I've shot on 2.5 and thought that was great, but you do need to be, you know, a meter and a half uh, or about, you know, four to five feet away from the screen, or you can go down and really pay a lot for a screen and maybe get like an 0.8 pixel pitch. Uh, that would be superb. Um, but really, it also comes down to uh, which camera you're using is a large format, medium format, what lenses are you using, the spherical or the anamorphic. Uh, and really, uh, I would say spend a day. Uh, going through all your scenes uh, when you're on set. So when you're rehearsing, go through all your digital scenes and, and really figure out the blocking, like how close you can get your, your uh, LED screen. But, you know, ideally you're not standing next to it anyways if you're shooting action. Exactly. Yeah. There so a, a lot, oh, go ahead, Greg. Sorry, there, there was a question I answered uh, just in the, in the text chat about this, which is exactly right. Uh, first of all, uh, having camera with a rehearsal day to just get familiar with the screens is crucial because you avoid a lot of trying to figure it out when you're shooting the scenes. And doing that, getting you see how close you can get to the screen without a moray problem. That's one thing to figure out latency. If you're going to move really fast with the camera, does the screen need to catch up? That's another thing you can discover. Um, but I think what you're going to find is you're, you're building an environment for that screen that's digital at that point. And so if you need to see that environment, if you're focusing on that thing, you don't want to shoot the screen anyway. You know, that can be a digital shot or something you can easily add, shoot your actor. Correct. Um, and your, your camera is a virtual camera. So you'll find if you move really move close to the screen, everything will distort anyways. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but you can have virtual production. You can have multiple screens showing multiple environments on your set. So, I mean, it really opens up to a new world. Uh, sometimes you will be close to the screen if you have separate worlds within, uh, within your virtual world. Um, but yes, testing, testing, testing. That testing doesn't take more than a day. And pre-lighting is another big one. You know, give, give your DP and DIT a day to just go through every scene on that wall and preset their general lighting so that when you get there and you're ready to go to scene 52, you hit a button, it's there, maybe a few adjustments, but few adjustments because you're already kind of planned it out. Greg, please be my producer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I'm available. <laughs> So um, really the theme today that we're really hitting on is a lot on pre-production, a lot of like efforts, a lot of time spent on pre-production. And sometimes that can be uncomfortable. So, uh, so one of the questions here is like for creatives that are accustomed to being able to leave decisions till later in the schedule, has there been resistance to making those decisions in prep? And how do you, <laughs> how do you help usher as a producer or your, you know, VFX producer, VFX supervisor, how do you help usher that conversation? Even DP. 
I, I'd say from a DP standpoint, before we move into the producer is it's very difficult working with a director who doesn't want to approach a problem either because uh, they don't want to expose that they don't know or they haven't quite figured out the script. Well, you need to start picking apart the script now and figuring out if there's something in the script that doesn't make sense. Don't leave anything open-ended and just really just pull off that band-aid. So over to you, Greg. Yeah, no, that, that's a huge, <laughs> it's a huge uh, bonus for all this is that you are making those hard decisions up front so that you, you have less to have to decide later. But uh, most creative filmmakers are gonna not wanna be locked into something early on. They're gonna wanna have flexibility. They're gonna wanna know if I decide this now, what options do I have later to pivot? Uh, and it's uh, some of these things you do have options. You know, you, you can build your environment for the wall. And if it's in a game engine like Unreal, you can make changes on the day. You can move things around a little bit. You can change your lighting. Um, you're not locked into just it's baked and that's it. That's the, that's the beauty of virtual production. But, um, you know, having to make decisions early on, you know, are, are we using this look from Iceland? Or are we doing this with a purple sky or, you know, what? What's the basic parameters of what we're going to have in six months on that screen? You have to kind of decide early. There's resistance to it. There are so many benefits, though. Once I think they start to get a sense of the benefits of all of these techniques, uh, you kind of want to make those decisions. You want to dive in. Yeah. yeah can, I, can I just add something really quickly to that? And I think this is just like the technological shift, like when we went from like film shooting film just like a traditional to from traditional to digital and there was so much pushback you know and a lot of filmmakers were like no never and then little by little little acid to cover and they saw the benefits they're like ah and so this is just something that's going to happen as well yes yeah a couple of resources we wanted to highlight vs has a virtual production resource page please check it out there's also the epics of uh, virtual production field guide and then the next slide, our closing slide, we are having our part two panel, a uh, different set of panelists, but we will be doing breaking down scheduling, budgeting, crewing for virtual production. I just wanna thank um, all of my panelists. You're amazing. It was so great to walk through this with, uh, with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you again to the VES and PGA for hosting and for everyone involved in helping to get this going. So. Thank you for, uh, thank you everyone. We hope to see you on the next one. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Bye much. Guys. You're awesome. Thanks everyone. Thank you.